Flags of many nations flew above, a top ten full of songs we love. Canada, Germany, Belgium and Italy coexisted most unbitterly. Newsflash people, it's February 11th, 1990 and things are all in all pretty darn good. Let's go through the top ten for that week and see what delights we may find. In at number ten, literally because it is debuting in that spot, is Blue Sky Mine by that band I love so well, Midnight Oil. It's one of their typically ranty rants, but there is a sad story about it, the tragedy of Wittenoom, a town that was all but abandoned in 1966 because of what then became known about as Bestos. That terrible circumstance aside, for all of Midnight Oil's avowed socialist principle, the song is actually, and probably inadvertently, a pretty concisive backhanded vindication of the capitalist system. In it, for example, they sing the sweat of my brow keeps feeding the engine. But they don't acknowledge that without the engine, that sweat is worthless. And that's not the fundamental fault of capitalism, as they seem to think. That's the fundamental triumph. Capital is a fixed value, labour is a variable, and in an open market, the worker is able to take his or her sweat wherever it pays them best to do so. They also touch on the ancillary benefit of capital, the ability to spread risk and reward away from capital stakeholders to shareholders. As a chap who primarily divides his income from shares, no, this YouTube channel does not keep me in the fabulous lifestyle you see me enjoying, it is nice to get a shout out. As they say, capitalism is the worst thing in the world until you consider the alternatives. The song came in with a bang this week at 10 and out with a thud next week, absenting itself from the golden circle for a fortnight before re-entering and limping back into eight. Opinion, but I will give the oils two things. No one ever said they weren't a musically interesting band and it does have the closest thing they've ever done to a pop song in King of the Mountain. The other thing is that some of the best, wildest, craziest gigs I've ever been to were midnight oil shows about 40 years ago. Wow, so long since I gave a place call, I've forgotten where I am. Uh, nine. And at nine, it is she of the startling eyes and rumbly mezzo, Alana Miles with Black Velvet, a pian to the king by the name of the hair dye he best loved. I can't help but think this is a song better served country style, but Miles gives it plenty and truly makes it memorable. Stood good duty on the charts for 21 weeks, but it got no higher than number three. It shot at the top block by the invincible Sinead O'Connor. Her next hit, Love Is, was climbing up the charts as this one was still climbing too. Happy days for Alana. Eight is this week's hot new hit makers Millie Vanilli with their second hit Girl I'm Gonna Miss You. Much like the much missed Paul Lacarcus, they were good looking, well one of them looks like he's been whacked in the face with a shovel but the other one was a solid seven and a half. Fellas discovered in a disco. The second discovery was a week later that neither of them could sing worth a good goddamn. Turns out that didn't matter because the guys were just stand-ins for the two real vocalists, a couple of guys called Brad and John, who were deemed insufficiently attractive and the album had already been recorded. Did this sound like a warning to either Millie or Vanilli? Nope. They'd signed contracts they never read and now it was time to pay the piper. Seven million albums later, it came to the attention of the media that neither of the boys could actually speak much English. And yet they sang English perfectly. The blind eye was unturned when Rob Pilatus, I don't know if he was Millie or Vanilli, bizarrely claimed to be the next Elvis Presley and the press just said, we're tired of this silly bullshit. And it all fell apart pretty quickly. The boys tried the old, oh, it's been hell having to lie to you all. We're artists, but our maniac manager wouldn't let us express ourselves. Then they released some music which revealed just how bad they were and everybody said, thank you, maniac manager. It was all kind of shabby and ridiculous and poor old Rob Pilatus, I'm not sure again if he was Millie or Vanilli, didn't survive the 90s, dead in a Frankfurt hotel room from a booze and pillow D at the age of 33. Holy moly, this is taking forever. At seven, with my favourite song in the charts this week, it's that all-American girl, Debbie, or now Deborah Harry, with her stonking I Want That Man. It's the kind of record she really should have made more of in the late 80s, 90s, out rocking Madonna and all the other pretenders to her crown, but still hanging on to that layer of class that always surrounds her. It's more contemporary than Blondie's eclectic classicism, would have allowed it to be, but it still sounds unmistakably like Debbie Harry. But domestic duties saw her further priorities fall elsewhere, but I'm thankful we got this. In at the sexy six is Crying in the Chapel by Sydney's Peter Blakely, a man whom no less a luminary than Ahmet Erdogan described as the finest white soul singer he'd ever heard. And for someone who is so undoubtedly talented, he is an object lesson to all those talent show vocalists who pull out hysterical over-wobbly melismas as a party trick, 
on how to use it to a devastatingly correct effect. He never really made much more of a bump in the charts. The follow-up, a cover of the first time ever I saw your face, peeped into the top 20. And after that, well, there was a follow-up album three years later that met with ambivalence. And then... So if you're watching, Pete, call home. The folks are worried. Crying in the Chapel was a good-sized hit. 22 weeks on the chart for a top of three. Look alive, it's time for five. It's Pump Up the Jam by those Belgian boffins Technotronic. Now, while it's not the worst example of this kind of rattle and clankery going around, that's at number three, it's a very interesting record. This spent six months in the top 40, and we haven't seen that many records managed that much so far. We've got a seven month to come. Seven of those weeks were in the top 10, but it only got as far as number four. I'd hazard a guess to say anyone who had an Amiga 500 or a 1200 if you were a rich computer at one point in time or the other used it to make music very much like this. Like me. Yes, I was an Amiga nerd. It's time for the segment that has certain controversial televangelists getting lathered up into a moral panic and fulminating wildly from their pulpits. Hello and goodbye, where we say hello, hello, hello to our up-and-comers this week and tell those departing not to let the door hit them where our dog should have bit them. And this week in our Blue Sky Mine and Black Velvet, the latter to enjoy much more success than the former, but you already knew that. Going the other way this week were Martika's cover of I Feel the Earth Move all the way down from 9 to 14 after 10 weeks in the 10 where it tapped out at 2. And the go-go gone and went for Belinda Carlisle where Leave a Light On fell from 10 to 16. Carlisle never really made the most of her potential as a solo artist, I feel. She always got good songs, she always gave them a good belt, but somehow there was always just something missing. Our next number one is still to come. But don't worry too much, it only eventually troubles the scorers for just a week as a huge juggernaut is rolling up behind it. Next week it will debut at 37, the week after that it will be number one. And it will hold that spot for eight weeks, vanquishing four different number twos and becoming a rare member of the 100 Club. Songs that have scored 100 points or more on my scoring algorithm. Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor. There are only 16 members of that club and ABBA are the only two time members. Usually at this point we do number four, and this week is no exception. And what would the late 80s, early 90s be without a soppy power ballad? Here it is provided by Bad English with When I See You Smile. It sounds like something from 1983 or 1984. It's a Diane Warren song, perfectly calculated mid-Atlantic arena rock. All the hairstyles are perfect for the video. You can hear the smell of teeth whitener on his voice. Mesa or Soldano amps are cranked, rap pedals or maybe DOD distortions, someone made a million bucks. Anyway, it was around for an age all over the radio, but it only got to number four, so... Back at five, we had an example of what could only have happened in 1990-type dance music, and that's quaint and emblematic of that era. Here at three, though, with Black Box's Ride on Time, we have an example of what is, to me, a damning indictment of the era. Annoying, repetitive, screechy, loud and boring. I'm not saying the whole world went to hell the moment it was first released, but I am saying it got a lot closer to it than it needed to be. For some reason, Kmart decided to spearhead an ad campaign with this a little while back. Unless they were trying to sell headache powders, I can't see why. Number two this week is Janie's Got a Gun from Aerosmith, a song more interesting for its video than its actual tuneless plodding record. The video being directed by David Fincher, who was, in the wake of having done Madonna's Vogue video, quite a hot ticket. That's about it, really. This made number one next week, probably because people were bored with six weeks of the current number one, and probably because Nothing Compared to You wasn't released a week earlier. Here are some remarkable facts. The national animal of Scotland is the unicorn. All Fruit Loops are the same flavour, regardless of their colour. And from 1912 to 1952, architecture was considered an Olympic sport. All of those were absolutely true and likely to be useful to you in real life. These ones, well, well from column A, well from column B. It's Fowl's fantastic world of fat. Big rise of this week is How Am I Supposed to Live Without You by our very own bellowing oaf, Michael Bolton. Seriously, this guy knew how to have hits up a gargantuan 26 places to 18. Biggest fall of this week was the universally beliked Alice Cooper, whose bed of nails has spiked in popularity and is now dropping 12 places to 35. Biggest debutante this week, of course, is Blue Sky Mine, which is impressively in at 10. And the longest running record on the charts is those merry German pranksters Millie Vanilli, who made us all look like silly billies for 25 weeks with Baby Don't Forget My Number. 
And really, it'd be better if she just wrote it down, you know. In the USA this week, the number one record was Opposites of Track by Paula Abdul, which reached the pinnacle on April 15th. And in the UK, Sinead O'Connor reigns supreme with Nothing Compares to You. A year ago, one of the first records we ever truly shredded in this series, in edition number five. Ah, I remember it like it was yesterday. And still to my mind, one of the worst number ones we've ever had, Kokomo by the Beach Boys, sullied the glorious shrine of number one. Number. This time next year, it'll be time to stop, collaborate, listen, with the surely not as bad as it is remembered, Ice Ice Baby. And the number one album in town this week was Pump by Aerosmith, up from five for the first of three weeks aloft. As I sit recording this in early December 2023, our Spotify wrapped packages have just arrived. Now, for those of you not familiar with the concept, a Spotify wrapped package is basically a summary of your listening habits for the year through the, through the application. Um, it reveals to me that I listen to 7,509 different songs by 1,755 different artists, covering 44,587 minutes of listening. Now that, of course, doesn't count vinyl plays. It also provides a list of the 100 songs you played most often. Now, this, of course, is inevitably coloured by the fact that I play a lot of music on Spotify as part of research for various videos, but I thought we might share the 12 most played songs from that top 100 list. There will never be any peace. When I see something, I wish I had shut up. And when I try to... I'm soft and see only a man. Still here singing my song. Well, it's time to unveil our number one record this week, but I have some sad and shocking news. Monty the Safety Monkey won't be with us this week, nor will he be with us for the foreseeable future. It's all over the news here in Australia, so I may as well share it with you. He's in prison at the moment for non-payment of his taxes. But fear not, I have recruited top-class talent to replace him. I have booked the fellow who plays the bongos in Scooby-Doo chase scenes. So let those bongos hammer for my monkey in the slammer. And at number one this week for the last of six is Love Shack by the B-52s, all jangly chaos and crazy 90s day-glow psychedelia. I don't think anyone thought these guys had another hit in them, especially after Ricky Wilson's sad death in 1985, but here they are. It was a good size hit too, and while the 90s are the least mythologised and sentimentalised decade, and that is unlikely to change anytime soon, if it does, this happy little dance floor filler will lead the charge. And there we have it. That's how the cow ate the cabbage for the week ending February 11, 1990. It wasn't so terribly dreadful, was it? No. All that remains for me to say is that the good lords are willing and the creeks don't rise. We'll be back here with a new instalment next week. Gish.